Okay, and so now to a very warm welcome um, to Dr. Nick Gall, uh, who's going to be talking to us about recognizing automatic autonomic dysfunction um, and testing for autonomic dysfunction POTS. So very warm welcome to, to Nick. Thank you very much. So managed to find the lights, as you probably noticed. So hopefully that will allow it to present better. Um, so obviously, um, uh, thank you very much for um, introducing me and asking me to, to present. Um, I forgot the um, conflicts of interest, but I have no conflicts of interest other than uh, I'm a patron of POTS UK and therefore have a great interest in POTS and making sure that it's managed properly. Um, so this is very much a talk about POTS because this is also a POTS masterclass, but I hope that this is therefore instructive for those who are interested in, in long COVID. So um, where does POTS fit in? Uh, fortunately, we have a number of autonomic neurologists um, in the audience who can put me right. Um, but this is a sort of, this is rather an old slide of the group of um, orthostatic intolerance syndromes. So a problem in the system where blood essentially doesn't get pumped up properly from your legs to your heart to your brain. Um, and over on the right hand side are the very serious autonomic failure conditions that um, the, the autonomic neurologists deal with. Um, over on um, this side, so over on, on the left side of your screens, the fainting, uh, the things that dominate uh, presentations to syncope clinics and casualty, um, and then uh, POTS, which is there in the middle. So a more milder form of dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. So what is POTS? Well, it's a syndrome. So, and that's important. So it's not one disease. So therefore it, it may be different when you talk to different patients and it may respond differently on tests and it may respond differently to treatments. But in some way, it is a failure of some part of the system to pump blood upwards. So that may be an abnormality in blood volume. So that just the blood volume is too small. It may be a failure of peripheral vasoconstriction. So those blood vessels in your legs don't tighten up enough. It may be that the blood is going to the wrong place at the wrong time. It's all going to your gut and not going to your brain. Although a classical description from patients is it when they wash their hair in the shower, it all goes to their arms and not to their brain while they're showering. Um, or it may be an abnormality in heart rate response, or it may be a mixture of all of those to some degree. But it's all about the inefficiency of the system of getting blood upwards. There is a definition. Um, and we've heard some of the definition already. It um, was originally defined in 1993. Uh, there is uh, guidance, the 2015 Heart Rhythm Society guidance. Uh, and essentially the, the definition is, it is a postural tachycardia of more than 30 beats a minute, sustained over 10 minutes without a fall in blood pressure associated with symptoms, um, which is essentially what that says. So, um, that's the official definition. How do we recognize the patient? Because it's not about just standing the patient up and seeing their heart rate. Well, um, it's by symptoms, as we've heard, and they need to be prolonged symptoms. So the, the official definition requires really six months of symptoms. We can recognize that actually an awful lot of people will feel potsy um, straight after a viral illness. But fortunately, a lot of it gets better. So, so there is definitely uh, a syndrome of orthostatic intolerance that uh, occurs after acute illness. But if it is persistent and lasts for more than six months, then it is called uh, the postural tachycardia syndrome. Um, importantly, in the message for the, for the generalists out there is that it's actually rather common. Nobody really knows how common it is, but it's been estimated perhaps about one in 500 patients um, or one in 500 people will have POT. So that's actually the same incidence as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, and, and for the, the, the cardiology interested, um, most hospitals will have a cardiologist, a clinic who are interested in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but I don't think we can say that about POTS. It is very much more common in women um, and it tends to be younger women. Uh, so it tends to be, 15 to 35 is the classical. That doesn't mean that we don't see patients who are older. It doesn't mean that it can't develop older, but the vast majority of our patients seem to be of this demographic. And 
Prior to COVID, it was particularly precipitated by other viral illnesses like uh, glandular fever, but obviously now we will see a larger number of patients coming with COVID. Um, the, the symptoms over on the right-hand side of the slide detail the sort of symptoms that we hear about. This comes from a, a, a big internet registry um, that Dysautonomia International, uh, the sister charity in the States ran. Um, so over 4,000 patients, and you can see why so many of our patients are managed by and investigated by cardiologists, because essentially our patients present in general with cardiological symptoms, chest pain, breathlessness, palpitations, dizzy spells, blackouts. But there's an awful lot of other associated features. So an awful lot of other patients or a lot of our patients will get gastrointestinal disturbance. They will get migraines. Uh, they will have the, the sort of the more non-specific, difficult symptoms, fatigue, brain fog, um, bladder symptoms. So a wide range of symptoms which are very easily ignored. You can't possibly have all of these symptoms. It must be therefore a psychological diagnosis until you think that, yes, actually, this is, if this is an autonomic condition, uh, actually, you can have all of those symptoms. So a very large range of symptoms, not just cardiovascular which perhaps when we hear about the treatment um, is important to, to remember that just giving cardiological treatments then are not necessarily going to make the patient feel 100% better. So, but the sort of things that we hear in cardiology, we hear the full range of cardiac symptoms. We will hear chest pain. Nobody understands the chest pain associated with POTS. Um, a lot of it is musculoskeletal um, and during the day, we will begin to understand why there may be upper GI, so esophageal dysmotility, reflux symptoms, but also there is tightness, there is chest tightness, which sounds a bit like angina. There potentially may be some theoretical reasons why there might be uh, coronary artery dysfunction. We don't know, but there's a lot of chest pain that goes around. A lot of our patients describe breathlessness. A lot of patients describe, I feel more breathless than I should be. Lots of dysfunctional breathing, sighing, yawning, gasping, and um, we will hear from um, Charlie later on uh, about dysfunctional breathing and how important that is to what we see. Um, there's lots of ankle swelling. There's also lots of um, leg discoloration. So this uh, thing called acrocyanosis that we don't quite understand. Lots of patients will refer to it as pooling. Uh, I think that whether it really is too much blood in your legs or whether it's um it's been postulated that it may relate to skin ischemia but you can see particularly with those pictures um how legs go purple and red and mottled uh, often known as corn beef legs uh by uh the patients so lots of lots of ankle swelling and leg discoloration on standing lots of palpitation um some ectopic beats lots of patients will describe ectopics but actually, I don't know that uh, POTS patients have any more ectopy than anybody else, but their palpitation very much relates to their sinus tachycardia that Dan was alluding to. So a persistent sense that my heart is just too fast. It's just doing too much. It's loud. It's fast. Lots of dizziness. There's lots of um, different forms of dizziness. Lots of faintness. I feel faint when I stand up. Um, a small proportion of POTS patients will lose consciousness. They will progress on to a vasovagal event. You don't have to faint um, to have POTS. Um, lots of times we see people in clinic who've been told you can't have POTS because you don't black out or you, uh, you do black out, therefore it can't be POTS. Um, but it's all postural faintness um, it re relieved by sitting or, or, or more commonly uh, lying flat. There are many associated features, so it is not just a cardiological set of symptoms. And, and I think that uh, what we've learned by managing and assessing and listening to patients, as has been mentioned, is, is hearing the vast range of associated symptoms. Um, so we recognised very early on with um, our physiologists noted lots of dysfunctional breathing on various testing that, that we'll, we'll talk about. There's a huge amount of dysfunctional breathing in our patients, uh, and Charlie's published on his experience. Many patients describe any level of dysmotility, sickness, vomiting, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, often 
labelled as IBS in a rather throwaway um, comment, oh, it's just IBS, dear. Um, but there's an awful lot of symptomatology, an awful lot of distress caused by those gut symptoms. Um, lots of bladder disturbance. Um, uh, I, I can't go, I can hold my bladder for the whole day. It, it, I have to think about going, I'm going very frequently. Um, our neuro-neurologists at King's published a small series of our patients, um, which showed uh, essentially neuropathic bladders. They said these bladders look like a diabetic's bladder. So there are lots of bladder symptoms. They may not ruin their lives particularly, um, but it's important and there are simple ways of helping. Um, most of our patients have migraines. Most of our patients seem to have vestibular migraines. So not only do I get migraines some of the time, but I, everything's spinning. So they get the vertiginous dizziness as well as faintness. Um, and differentiating those because they're caused by entirely different pathophysiologies is important because they need different treatments. And, and you know, lots of our patients will have very significant and chronic migraines. Obviously, a lot of our patients, although not necessarily all of the long COVID, will be hypermobile. Hypermobility in some way seems to underpin this. There's lots of joint symptoms. Um, there's lots of insomnia. Um, Guy Leshner and colleagues at, uh, at Guy's have, have published, amongst others, on the insomnia. We're not too distant from the Hospital for Integrated Medicine and their insomnia clinic who see lots of our patients. Insomnia is a very important symptom. And um, hopefully later on, we will hear about the histamine problems. So our patients have all of these things. And my view is that we need to ask about all of this. So uh, very much echoing thoughts from earlier saying, we need general physicians. You have to be interested in this as a generalist. This is not a heart rate issue. This is a systemic problem. So if we've got usually a young woman, but not exclusively, who's presenting with this group of symptoms, yes, let's think about how we can investigate them. The definition is all based on heart rate and blood pressure change. So let's do some blood pressure and heart rate measures. This is and this comes from a beat to beat blood pressure system just to um, take you around it. The green line is the heart rate. The two red lines are systolic and diastolic. Uh, the scale is 40, 80, 120, 160 up the side. And you can see this patient's lying flat for 10 minutes. Their heart rate's 80. As soon as they stand up, blood pressure takes a dip. So it, it drops and comes back up again. Initial orthostatic hypotension or uh, head rush. Um, and then immediately, uh, the heart rate increases. So the heart rate in this patient then increases by, by 40 beats a minute. But also importantly, um, I hope you can see that the blood pressure becomes more variable and the, it swings up and down every few seconds. Um, these are known, uh, I am told, uh, as Maya waves. And perhaps this, this is blood pressure cycling um, due to excess adrenaline, it seems. Um, and this is perhaps even a better guide to orthostatic intolerance than the heart rate increase. So a significant heart rate. And, and of course, if you're measuring this with a single blood pressure cuff, a reading every few minutes, you're not going to see it. But it's the significant heart rate increase, but particularly the blood pressure variability that we see that is so important. That bit of kit costs 25 grand. So you can't buy it, you can't buy it off Amazon. So perhaps doing something like this is more practical. So the NASA lean test or just an active stand uh, at home. Um, this is a form that, that we've written, or I've written, uh, but you can find others on the internet. It's basically 10 minutes of lying flat and then 10 minutes of standing with minutely heart rates and blood pressures. And you can do it at different times of the day and you can write down your symptoms because of course symptoms are the most important. So, so this may be a good thing. We send it out to a lot of patients Fill this in and let's have a look. It's important that we, we've, we've, de we've defined it as 30 beats a minute, or, or it was defined as 30 beats a minute. Do not, however, get focused on 30. Doctors, medical staff focus on 30. Patients are absolutely obsessed. I was going to use a very rude word with 30 beats. Doc, doc, I've got 30. It was 29, yes, I know, but you've taken my diagnosis away from me. I've got 30. Look, here, I've sent you a photograph of it. I'm not interested. 
because it's much, much more than 30 beats a minute. The original publication from Schondorf and Lowe, 1993, has been used as the definition. They studied retrospectively 16 patients. They didn't know what was wrong with them. They said, this is postural tachycardia. Oh, aren't you unwell? Oh, don't, doesn't your heart rate go up? So what, what they did was that they defined this as more than two standard deviations away from the mean. So they arbitrarily drew a line in the sand and said 30. 30 is not the be all and the end all. It's not 29, you're mad, 30, you've got a disease. Um, on, over on the left-hand side is a, a study that Satish Raj and colleagues, uh, probably when he was at Vanderbilt, did when they were saying, should you use an active stand? Should you use a tilt table test? Is there a difference? Their overall conclusion was that you probably didn't need to, you could do either. But they tested all of these patients uh, between eight and nine o'clock in the morning. They were all fasted. They'd all had their medication stopped. I can guarantee you that most hospitals in the UK who have a tilt service, an awful lot don't, but they do not do testing like this. And this was a very specific study done so that it was in a scientific environment. So do not get focused that it is just 30 beats a minute and therefore that is your diagnosis or not. So remember that there's a lot of people who are fainty out there. There's this smaller group of orthostatic intolerance. I feel ill when I stand. Only a smaller proportion of those will fill the, fulfill the criteria for POTS. That doesn't mean um, that these people are, do not feel ill. It does not mean that they are mad. So there is a lot of orthostatic intolerance out there and you can see those changes on those, that beat to beat blood pressure to see that there are abnormalities. So just, you just have to remember that. So, and this has been sort of taken on by um, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and their consensus, which was published in 2020, which said, yes, there are people who fulfill criteria for POTS, but there are also people who have postural symptoms without tachycardia. So it's more complicated than just 30 beats a minute. So it's, it's all about listening to the patients and hearing their symptoms. We have colleagues in the audience who are autonomic neurologists who do their own brand of testing. Um, they are no more right or wrong than I am. There is no international consensus about what tests to do. This is what I do because I am a cardiologist. So I do cardiological testing. It's actually about recognizing the pattern. So we do lots of tilt table testing. This comes from the, um, the international guidelines which basically say that, to be honest, we, nobody really knows what tests to do. We do halter monitors um, to look for arrhythmia, but just because we don't see an arrhythmia doesn't mean that that's where the uh, diagnosis ends, because actually when you look at the heart rate variability and the heart rate trends, you can find greatly interesting data. These, this patient is spending most of their day at 100 beats a minute and more. Um, this patient has a very spiky heart rate profile. Every time they do anything, their heart rate goes fast. So actually the interest of the Holter monitor is not, yes, it is a bit to make sure we're not missing an arrhythmia and to count those ectopic beats and reassure, but it's about the heart rate trend. So you can learn a great deal. And I can guarantee that, that virtually all of the patients that we see will have had a Holter. And of course it's easily accessible in primary care. We do an awful lot of cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Cardiopulmonary exercise testing is really difficult to access uh, because it's complicated and it's time consuming. But it was from this um, that our physiologists at King's recognized the dysfunctional breathing. Um, it's very interesting talking to sort of the major units at the Brompton and the Hammersmith, um, at St. Thomas's, who are also very interested in cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, it gives us an awful lot of information about levels of conditioning, but it also gives us the idea that, that so many of our patients uh, have abnormal breathing control. There is recent data to suggest, because we have no idea why, why patients hyperventilate, that it may be reduced blood supply to the chemoreceptors in the carotids that drives the, the dysfunctional breathing. Um, so very interesting review article um, that came out at the end of last year from um, some cardiovascular physiologists saying, actually, perhaps POTS is a respiratory condition. Um, we've looked at our small group of our 
patients with CPET. Why is this relevant? It's relevant because we found that most of our patients were hyperventilating. What was also important was that virtually all of our patients weren't deconditioned by standard deconditioning definitions. So POTS is not a disease of the unfit. It is not lazy girls, as I was accused of treating at an occupational health physician's conference. Most patients, yeah. Um, but I'm very grateful to them because it um, drove me to beg Steve and Alice to write this paper. Um, so deconditioning is important. Building up fitness is important but you will not cure the condition by fitness alone. You do some blood tests, nobody quite knows. Um, cortisol is very important, making sure we're not missing Addison's. Um, but I, I think Toby mentioned getting everything right. And actually we've really noticed that in POTS patients. You know, they, they need to have their irons, B12, folic acid, vitamin D to be perfect. They notice the difference, they notice everything. So getting that right. Shane's autonomic function testing. Um, it, we started off 17, 18 years ago, and Shane did autonomic function testing on, on all of our patients. But, we, you know, I, I, I now see 38, 39 patients every week at King's, so we can't do that. But it is helpful um, to do the more detailed autonomics, particularly when we see the younger patients who might be hypermobile but also have diabetes. So where we're interested in trying to differentiate is this hypermobile related dysregulation or is it underlying autonomic failure? Um, so whatever brand of AFTs you, you, you do, they can be very helpful. So POTS is an abnormality in the neural control of the cardiorespiratory system. So this is part of the problem and why we, we bang on about it and we run conferences like this because it's an abnormality in the nerve control of the heart. So it's not a heart problem, it's a nerve problem that presents with heart disease, heart symptoms, which makes it difficult. More common in young women, but it's multi-systemic. And obviously we're going to hear um, from Leslie about treatment. And obviously we know that a part of long COVID uh, is POTS. So to mention the, the case history, um, obviously we don't know in this case history as to how POTSy she is, but there are a number of features. She's describing breathlessness. Could that be dysfunctional breathing? She's describing palpitations. She's describing chest pain. She's describing lightheadedness. She's describing exercise intolerance. This is my manner. So this, this lady needs to be assessed for POTS. And, and also coming along to the, this little bit at the bottom, mild asthma. Charlie, I hope will mention, you know, he's, he's, and I, I, he said this, uh, and, and I, I say this to so many patients. Most of our patients are diagnosed with asthma most of our patients don't have asthma. So it's not, and the problem is, as we will hear from Leslie, I'm sure, propranolol, pyridostigmine, great treatments, not a good idea in asthmatics. So we're immediately cutting down a large number of the drugs that we can use for our patients if we just give them this throwaway diagnosis of asthma. There was also just finally a, a, a little question about transfer factor. I don't know, but there are small, few case reports in the literature of postural changes in transfer factor. So they've looked at one or two case reports of patients with Parkinson's where they did transfer factor standing up, abnormal transfer factor lying down, normal. So it may be a lung perfusion issue. I don't know. It seems to be quite difficult to get postural transfer factor. We used to do transfer factor at King's um, on all of my patients and just kept coming up with abnormalities. They've all got mildly to moderately impaired transfer factor. Where does it come from? Sent along to respiratory, don't know, we've done all the tests. Maybe it's posture. Um, so testing, you can't do what I do um, because there isn't enough resource. So maybe in primary care, listen, ECG blood tests, do a simple stand test, make sure you're not missing respiratory illness and then think, actually, I think you've got POTS. Let's do some simple things. In the POTS clinic, yes, it's all of those things. It's whatever, if you're, if you're at Queen Square, all of the autonomic testing that they do so well in, uh, for our side, the cardiological testing um, and try to come up with a diagnosis. You want to know more about POTS in us? Shameless plug. 
we have written a textbook. Lots of people in the audience have contributed to this textbook. Um, and on that bombshell, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, again, uh, Nick, for that comprehensive review on, on recognising and then assessing. So what well, we've decided to take questions as we go. So um, firstly, just those in the audience, if there are questions, uh, Mina's checking online for those as well. So Thank you. I'm Stephanie to George, I'm a GP. Um, lots of patients come in using um, heart rate monitors attached to watches or devices that way. And actually I'm finding it incredibly helpful. Do you have any that you think are better than others? And, or do you rely on them for patterns if nothing else? So I'm curious to think your thoughts on wearable tech yes, for this. Yes, um, so, uh, so yes, of course we get an awful lot um, I think that the Cardia system that you can buy linked into mobile phones and built into the latest Apple watches, if you can show me an ECG and I can see it and I can see the arrhythmia, then I'm, then I'm very interested and, and they can be very helpful. They overcall AF. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that, that in, um, in the States, in, in California, it was designed to say we need to find a device that looks for AF because that's where the money is. Um, so it, it often very much overcalls AF and th that can be a problem. Young people saying I've got AF. So, so show me the ECG. Most of the time it's electrical noise. Y you know, uh, we've had, I get lots of emails, but it, it said that my QRS is broad. Can you explain this now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I personally find the pulse oximeter the world's most inaccurate device. Doc, it says that my, no, no, my oxygen saturation is 74%, I'm dead. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, but, but also explain it. And, you know, I need an urgent review in the POTS clinic and we have an eight month wait um, because my pulse oximeter says that I'm hypoxic. Uh, so, so I really, really big pinch of salt. Um, with the pulse oximeter. Sorry, just a quick what, what about for heart rate? So, know, sure, for heart, for rate, heart, for heart rate, I, I think it's very much a, a broad, well, so it depends that the heart rate with the pulse ox is, is very much if it's picking up the, the right, the, you know, a, a good signal, but then how often do, do, is the patient able to give us a full history about that it's really picking, us, picking up a good signal? So I think if you're happy with the signal, if it's in front of you, I think that's very he helpful. I think that if you've got broad heart rate information from the Apple Watch or the Garmin or whatever, Polar or whatever, that says my average heart rate was this, my resting heart rate was 60, my average heart rate now is 80. You say, well, that's interesting data. I get too many emails with a tiny little blob circled on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> Doc, what is this? This must be an arrhythmia. Explain my arrhythmia. So, so I think a broad idea about heart rate and how it's changed, I think is, is, is probably very interesting. I, I, but it, there's a big pinch of salt. Well, Wanda, can I, can I just add to as well, not just, sorry, not just for the heart rate and the heart rhythm, a lot of these bits of kit now also do blood pressure. So, and, and really don't go anywhere near the watches for blood pressure is the way to go. You just, it really, it really doesn't work. Even though patients like it, bring it in, don't go there, stay away. So we've had quite a few questions on the specifics of the criteria. Um, and in particular, how long does the sustained abnormal heart rate need to be? Would a couple of minutes be sufficient? Or are we again back to the broad picture when it comes to the specifics? The, 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 the definition is 10 minutes. So, so if we're going to be specific about it, it should be 10 minutes. And, you know, I... I, I you know, so yes, it, it, you, you, can, you can see on that trace that I showed, it, it, it flipped up very, very quickly and stayed there for 10 minutes. But we have other people where it gradually drifts up uh, at, at 10 minutes. Um, so I, I think it's very variable. But we also see people who may have some degree of orthostatic intolerance where it peaks and then it gradually settles down again. Um, and so picking up those 
those ones who are maybe slightly different, we don't know. So I would much prefer that you stand up for 10 minutes and that we look at the data over 10 minutes. Um, but, but, but again, I mean, my, my own view of the diagnosis of all of this is, are you the right sort of person? Do you have the right sort of clinical findings? Have we made sure that we're not missing anything else? And do you get better with the treatments? So actually, I think that it's slightly more complicated and it's a little bit more, um, you know, it can't be quite so specific. Because again, um, if you go up to 20, but you feel great on my tablets, then actually I'm, I'm very happy. We're probably treating the right thing. Doc, I tried six different drugs and none of them have made me better. The reasons that drugs don't work is because we're not treating the right thing. And presumably there's a lot of variability. In there's there's huge amounts of variability. And, 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 and as I mentioned with Satish's uh, publication, different times of the day, worse in the morning, worse after a meal, worse at the time of the month or just before, worse after exercise. I and mean, this is why um, colleagues at Queen Square have such intensive testing of tilt, exercise, tilt, eat, tilt, et cetera, et cetera, which you know, br can bring that out. Very quick question, just on the quiet stand, just for the hypermobile population here, who find it difficult to do a quiet stand. How important do you think that is? Or do you think it's... I, I mean, to, to, well, I suppose, well, I, you stand for as long as you can. I mean, the kind of moving around. But there, moving right? around, um, yes, I, it probably will make a difference. Yeah. Um, you know, the, there is a difference in the physiology between an axis stand and a tilt because you are using different muscles. So, so it may reduce the, 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 the heart rate increase that, that we see. Um, but, but then, of course, you might also then say that the heart rate increase might go up because of pain. Yeah. Um, yeah. It swings complex. around. That. So that's why I think, yeah. I think thinking about it in much more broad terms rather than very great specifics, I think, is important. Hi, I'm Dr. Grimsell. I'm a retired GP, but now a tribunal doctor who sees a lot of people disabled with POX uh, and unable to work. I'd like to know what your views are on the natural history and the prognosis of POX. Do you see it getting better? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so, so I, I mean, prognosis, you know, there is no evidence that it kills anybody. It just makes you feel completely crap for years and years and years and years. Um, I, I think the, the point about it is I don't think we know because we because we just don't know enough about it. So we don't know what it's doing. Certainly in a small proportion of patients, it seems to damage small nerve fiber. So so we think that underlying there's the, in a proportion of people, there's a small fiber neuropathy. My impression with those is that they that is damaged and that is damaged full stop. Um, there are there is no doubt that a lot of people can improve and they improve with time and they improve with what they do and a little bit about what we do. I suspect that the earlier we pick people up and institute the sort of the lifestyle things, you know, is important. If we don't get on top of that and people become more and more deconditioned and bed bound, that, 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 they, that they will become iller. Um, so the, the problem of course with patients and uh, to some extent with the system is that I can't keep seeing everybody every year for the rest of their lives and my careers. Um, so um, at some point they leave and the ones who get better go away and don't tell me they've got better because we just don't see them again. Um, so so I, I think there probably is a, a, a lot of people who improve and may get back to some level of functioning and may become normal and just say, well, I'm just a bit fainty. Um, but there are people who are very significantly affected, but I don't know how we predict those. Um, and I don't know whether if we intervened earlier, whether a lot more of them would get better. Um, so I think it's very difficult. Of course, a lot of our patients are hypermobile um, and the hypermobility ain't going away. And that causes lots of joint pains and joint problems. And therefore, you know, they're going to remain ill from that side for a very long period of time. So it's very difficult to predict. We've got another. Take one more, yeah, from, one more um, and we've got one more here as well. Okay. 
Uh, so this is a question from someone working in a long COVID clinic where they're identifying a lot of people with postural hypertension rather than POTS. Should they still be looking for the multi-system involvement? Um, I, I think you, we then need to define why have they got postural hypotension? Because, because actually, um, on my original slide of orthostatic intolerance, the postural hypotension is over the other side. That's, that's, you're then starting to think, well, what causes that? Well, either it's acutely, I'm bleeding to death, uh, or I've got Addison's. Um, most of the time, it might be, I, you know, older patients whose uh, autonomic nervous system is, is, is dulled by age. Um, a lot of the time it's over treatment. It's doctor's fault because I'm giving you 14 drugs for your heart and more drugs you know, uh, for, for, for sleep and all of those sorts of things. So if it's not medical, we're then starting to think neurogenic orthostatic hypotension and that's their business. So, so actually, I think almost if you're finding OH, you need to be thinking more seriously. And with those sorts of neurological conditions, then yes, they will be multisystemic because again, it's affecting the same part of the system. And so I'm just going to sneak in because it does sort of relate the um, how you differentiate between POTS and inappropriate tachycardia. Oh. Oh. Um, you know, you say tomato and I say tomato. You know, it's it's the yes, the the, the, the guidelines are trying to differentiate them. I don't know that they're the same. I don't know that they're different. If you if you read the guidelines in detail, they say POTS is postural tachycardia that affects young women with a lot of associated autonomic symptoms. IST, however, is a sinus tachycardia that affects young women with a widespread number of autonomic symptoms. <laughs> um, and, you know, Shane said, you know, many, many years ago, um, you know, neurologists diagnosed POTS and cardiologists diagnosed IST. So it, they're, they're probably, in the end, the, the same condition or, or some variation of the same thing. So I treat it the same. Okay, over to Leila. Is it? Yeah. Yes, I'll be <laughs> uh, thank you, Nick. I've really enjoyed listening to you. Um, uh, so I'm a physiotherapist. I work in asthma clinics and long COVID clinics. So um, a lot of what you're saying chimes with, with um, my experience. Um, if For those of us who are perhaps thinking about possibly this is POTS that I'm seeing, what, what is the most useful thing to, for us to have done in um, terms of tests or investigations when we refer to you to a POTS clinic? From your perspective, <laughs> um, I, if you'd if you'd asked me a year ago, um, I would have just said you, the, just the fact that you thought about it, yeah. because because that's the thing. If you don't think about it, you don't make the diagnosis. If you think about it, then we can actually start somewhere. Um, the great difficulty that we've got, and I'm sure that it's the same at Queen Square and in the autonomic clinic at Kings is that we are so overwhelmed now to get to my clinic, you now have to have all of the tests done. So, so we're, we're now saying until you've done all the blood tests and the echoes and the halters and the excise test and the stand test, um, we're not going to be able to see you because what, what we found during COVID, I, I carried on doing clinics throughout COVID, was that because of the difficulties, the local hospitals would refuse to test so we would have to test the patients, but once they're in my clinic, we have to, we're doing it. So we would take three years to collect together that information. And it's only after three years do we finally have all the test results and we can start to treat the patients. Whereas if we say it, it actually is probably going to be easier for them to do the tests. So, so actually these days we have to get all the tests and it, and it may be just as simple as you saying to your cardiologist, we need to get a couple, we need to get these tests done and then you can refer them to Nick and he'll sort it out from there. But just thinking about the diagnosis is, is the, the major leap. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Um, you've been very popular. <laughs>